Okay, if, uh, if you could take your seats, please. We're about to start the uh, session here. Um, now, Scott Bolton, uh, uh, this is a, a Juno uh, union session. Uh, Scott Bolton's unable to be here today, so I'm filling in for him. Now, today's session is uh, set up with four invited talks. Uh, the talks are given by our, um, our discipline leads, uh, the first of which, uh, Dave Stevenson, he's the discipline lead for Interiors Group. Uh, the second, uh, Andy Ingersoll, who leads our Atmospheres uh, discipline. The third, uh, Barry Mock, who's with the uh, Magnetospheres Working Group. And uh, in the final, uh, Candy Hansen um, takes care of our um, JunoCam and the uh, education uh, outreach aspect of that. Um, so let's see, the talks are 29 minutes uh, in duration. The uh, light will be set to go off at 24. Um, and if you could wrap up by then, we'll have a few minutes for uh, question and answer. And we need to announce who the conveners are. We so, do. Yeah, we do. So I'm uh, Jonathan Lenny, and I'm the co-chair. The primary convener of this session was Scott Bolton. The co-conveners were myself, Glenn Orton, and Fran Bagginall. So thanks to everyone for organizing this. And now you can introduce okay. the first talk. So the first talk uh, by Dave Stevenson. Uh, Juno surprises the emerging view of Jupiter's interior. Where did the pointer go? Jupiter is big. And being big, it has a long memory. It remembers something about how it was put together. We also think that Jupiter was the planet in our solar system that formed first. And by virtue of that and being big, it had an enormous influence on the architecture of our solar system. It was also a fascinating body in terms of its structure and how it has evolved and how it works. These reasons, among others, are why we have the Juno mission. Before we had the Juno mission, we knew a number of things about the planet. We knew that it was made mostly of hydrogen. Uh, we knew that the central region of the planet might be enriched in heavy elements, made in perhaps to the extent of uh, a mass of around 10 or 20 Earth masses. And we knew that the magnetic field existed and in some respects had a similar character to Earth's magnetic field. Dipole tilt, similar. Quadrupole to dipole ratio, similar if viewed at the appropriate radius. And of course, the detection of the magnetic field and the associated synchrotron radiation enabled us to find a rotation rate for the deep interior with great precision and by comparing that with the motions in the atmosphere, we knew that the atmosphere had large differential rotation, uh, winds of order 100 meters per second. But we had no knowledge of the depth of those winds. Opinions on that question varied from a thin meteorological layer uh, of order 100 or so kilometers in depth, all the way to extreme depth all the way down to regions where we believed that the hydrogen became metallic. And we saw, when looking through uh, uh, telescopes and doing spectroscopic observations, that there was a cloud deck in the atmosphere of Jupiter, the Ammonia Cirrus, and in our usual understanding of what would happen in those circumstances, we expected that beneath those clouds, the ammonia would be well mixed. And then we had a mission in the 90s, the Galileo mission, a probe that went into the atmosphere uh, that found an enrichment of heavy elements, uh, specifically in the heavy noble gases, 
that was about three times solar. That particular probe saw very little water, so the question of how much water is there was left unresolved. Now with what we have at this stage in the Juno mission, which of course is incomplete, is a much better understanding of this planet. We think that Jupiter does have a central core, maybe 10 or 20 Earth masses. However, it's not sharply defined. It's diffuse. It has mixed out into the overlying metallic hydrogen. This is, in fact, consistent with current and recent ideas about what would happen as you build such a planet. We have seen a magnetic field that is not Earth-like. Indeed, it's not like anything that we've seen before. That's a consistent pattern, by the way. Every time we go to a planet and learn more about it, we find that the field is different from previous fields detected for other planets. And the character of that field includes strong patches, flux patches, regions of strong field, but not covering the complete surface. And the region in which this field is being generated extends out into the molecular envelope. We have found that the winds are neither shallow nor deep. And they are, in fact, extending, we think, to an intermediate level of order a few thousand kilometers, perhaps 3,000 kilometers in depth. And the most likely interpretation of this is the role of the magnetic field in determining the way that the winds behave. We have found that the ammonia that forms the cirrus clouds is not well mixed beneath those clouds. This is a major surprise, and we do not yet understand it. You will hear much more about that in the following talk. And in part because of this surprise, we have a somewhat uncertain water abundance. This is still ongoing work, and again, you will hear about that in the next talk. And of course, uh, Juno fits the pattern of planetary science missions in that uh, the results of the mission have led to surprises and puzzles. That's one of the measures of success in planetary science, that you don't find what you expected. So how do we do these things? How do we decide? How do we reach these conclusions I've just given you? Uh, in the case of gravity, you do it by tracking the spacecraft, uh, and that's leads to a gravitational field that you describe in the usual way using spherical harmonics. We have found so far that the field is spin axisymmetric. What that means is that the field can be expanded in the uh, coefficients that are called the j's, j sub n. We have, however, found that that gravity field is not north-south symmetric. So there's a difference between the two hemispheres, and that means that the odd j's are evident in the data. In the case of the magnetic field, you don't have symmetry. This is, of course, uh, something that we've seen already previously with other planets, including the Earth. And that means you have to map. And that means that the story for the magnetic field is incomplete. Uh, there's more to be done on that. Um, but again, uh, you can do a spherical harmonic analysis. And you can ask the question, down to what depth can I extend that field before I reach the region of currents. Uh, and then we have the microwave radiometer, which mainly deals with the atmosphere, but actually gives us information that's relevant to the interior models. In particular, we hope to use that to tell us how much water is uh, uh, in the outer envelope of the planet, and that's diagnostic of what happened when the planet formed. So the overall picture in terms of interior structure and learning about uh, formation and evolution is to combine information of the gravity field, magnetic field, and water abundance to say something about what happened when our planets formed. Here is a picture of what we thought about Jupiter before Juno. Uh, a core that 
was actually quite uncertain, in part because of our imperfect understanding of the equation of state of hydrogen, but perhaps uh, as much as 15 Earth masses. Most of the planet is metallic hydrogen, and then as you extend to the outer region, you have, uh, because of helium rain, a depletion of helium in the outermost molecular envelope. Uh, gravity, of course, is telling us about the distribution of mass throughout, and you might think, well, since the density in the atmosphere is four orders of magnitude less than the density deep down within the planet, the gravity is not telling you anything about the very outermost region. However, gravity, the measurements that we make are so exquisitely accurate, uh, approaching one part in 10 to the 8, that you can actually say something about the outermost regions. Uh, in the case of the magnetic field, what you're sensitive to, of course, is the region where there are electrical currents. And again, you might be tempted to think, well, that's the metallic region, but that it turns out to be not correct. Uh, and the reason is that when you have large fluid motions, even places where the conductivity is much lower than a metal can influence the magnetic field. And then, of course, we have the microwave radiometer that you will hear much more about in the next talk. And you might think of that as just telling you about a very thin outer region, but actually it's not that far removed from what we learn about in the case of the gravity field and the magnetic field. And, of course, that region is connected through convection to the interior. So in that sense, all of these three approaches are overlapping means of talking about the interior. I turn now to the interpretation of the deep interior, and I show here a slide uh, prepared by Tristan Guyot that reminds us about the sensitivity regions for the J coefficients in the representation of the gravity field. These are the even Js, the ones that are needed to describe the hydrostatic structure. And what they show, of course, is that as you go up, uh, from J2 to J4 to J6, you're increasingly sensitive to the outer region. Now, we think we actually know something about the outer region. We think it's adiabatic to a good first approximation. So even though coefficients like J4 and J6 are dominated by the outer regions, they're still telling us something about the deeper region to the extent that we think we already understand the outer region. It turns out that when you analyze these data and compare it with models, it's particularly useful to look at two coefficients, J6 and J4. So here you see a plot J6 on the vertical axis, uh, J4 on the horizontal axis. And I draw your attention first to the data. Those are the crosses. And what they show is that Juno is spectacularly better than previous estimates of these two coefficients. Juno data represented there by that small red cross. And in fact, in, in the case of this figure, just by the very first science orbit. Also on this figure are models. Now, I want to warn you about interior models. When you're fitting a small number of parameters, you can always fit the data. And so you don't decide on whether a model is good on the basis of whether it fits the data. You decide on whether a model is good by the combination of whether it fits the data and whether it makes physical sense. So in that respect, what's particularly interesting uh, in this plot is a point out towards the left, which is the Hubbard and Militzer model, uh, that purple dot there, which of course disagrees with the data, but it's very interesting because in the spirit of Occam's razor, it's a particularly simple model. It's a well-defined core with an envelope on top, and it clearly fails. And that's a warning about the need to do something more complicated. The models that already were compatible with what we found in the observation before we got those results, the uh, in particular, the work of Nettleman getting quite close. Those models worked because the outer region of the planet had a different composition from the region that's somewhat deeper down, but in my opinion, did not actually have a good physical explanation for why that should be so. 
the thing that makes sense, most sense, is the idea that the core is in fact not sharply defined, and that leads to a model which is the yellow circle there, which is the work of Sean Wall, which came after we got the data, <coughs> and does therefore, of course, put the data. And remember, that's not how you decide whether it's good. It's how you decide, you decide that on whether it makes physical sense. And the reason why it makes physical sense is because it's based on the idea that the core is not sharply defined. Now, actually, that's a perfectly reasonable idea. It's shown here on the right. Perfectly reasonable because that's the natural outcome of what happens when you build a planet uh, where you bring in solid material, add gas on top. Why? Because the temperatures and pressures during that accretion are such that those materials mix. And so you don't, in fact, expect a sharply defined core. This is evident in recent work, uh, especially the work of Peter Bodenheimer. Um, so the picture then is that this kind of structure where the core is not sharply defined is a natural outcome of the accretional process. It's also true that subsequent to the formation of the planet, you may get convective mixing upwards, uh, ideas that have been developed in detail by Jeremy LeConte and Gilles Chabrier. <clears throat> a way of thinking about this is shown in this diagram where the diagram on the left is the same as the one on the right, but actually means different things. The one on the left is telling you about the accretion history, uh, and so the horizontal axis there is a fraction of total mass aggregated as the planet formed, but you can also think of it as a time axis. And the idea is that you build an embryo that eventually becomes 10 Earth masses or so, but as you're building it, you have to add more gas to remain in hydrostatic equilibrium with the nebula, and that incoming material, whether it be pebbles or planetesimals, breaks up, disaggregates, and mixes the material Silicate or ice is super critical. It stays mixed, never unmixes. It's soluble in the hydrogen. And in that sense, the structure of the planet after it forms is a mimic of the accretion rate of solids and gases as it grows. Turning now to the question of the rotation state of Jupiter, uh, one idea might be that Jupiter is close to being rigidly rotating. Another possibility is that it rotates on cylinders. And again, one can look at this by looking at the gravity harmonics. And what is shown here is on the vertical axis, the J's, the even J's in particular, uh, as a function of the <coughs> uh, zonal harmonic degree uh, uh, index n. And if you have rigid body rotation, then the j's drop <coughs> uh, as a power law very steeply to very low values. But if you have differential rotation, then at some level, depending on the depth and amplitude of that differential rotation, you get a deviation away from that pattern. Uh, and indeed, that's what we saw. But most importantly, we saw something else. And that something else is hinted at here. This is just the zonal flow field in the atmosphere of Jupiter. And I draw your attention to the fact that there is a difference between the north and the south. And this asymmetry shows up strikingly in the gravity field through the odd harmonics. So the odd harmonics, the odd j's, are an expression in the gravity field of that asymmetry in the flow between north and south, and the strength, the amplitude of those j's is related to the depth of the flow, and the pattern of those j's is related to the fact that the flows we see in the atmosphere apparently have the same pattern as what's happening deep down. So that, in fact, is what the odd j's told us. This is uh, the work uh, led by Johai Caspi, uh, published in Nature earlier this year. Um, it's evident that there is a close connection between the winds we see in the atmosphere and the uh, flow that is uh, deeper down within the planet. 
this is not at all obvious, and it is a non-unique solution, but it is striking that this approach of downward continuation of the flows we see in the atmosphere actually seems to work. Uh, and in simple modeling of this, the suggestion is that the depth to which these flows extend is about 3,000 kilometers. Uh, and this suggests, as I will explain in the next couple of slides, the role of the magnetic field, the role of electrical conductivity. I should add as a caveat that we do not yet have a dynamical model for how the flows die with depth. We only have constraints, and so there is more work to be done. What is certainly important here is the electrical conductivity, and shown here is our best understanding of what the electrical conductivity is of hydrogen. You might think of the hydrogen deep down within the planet as being a metal, and indeed it is, but it doesn't suddenly change from being metallic to being an insulator. Uh, the temperature is such and the pressures are such that you can excite electrons across the conduction band, and so you have semiconduction uh, uh, with a slow decrease in the uh, electron abundance in this primarily molecular material as you proceed out towards the surface. This is uh, a behavior that emerges both in experimental shockwave data and in theoretical calculations. And in particular, if you're out at 97% of the radius of Jupiter, that's pretty close to the surface, uh, the conductivity is about one semen per meter, which is about the conductivity of salty water, or if you prefer, the human body. So MHD truncation of the flow is an attractive explanation of what's going on here. Um, it actually was uh, suggested in, in the uh, PhD thesis work of Zhang Shen Lu. Uh, she found 2,800 kilometers, coincidentally similar to the number that uh, Juno seems to suggest. Um, uh, Zhang Shen Lu and Tapio Schneider also liked the idea of MHD truncation as a way of providing the friction needed to close the meridional circulation that is present in the atmosphere. The conductivity of relevance is indeed around one semen per meter. That's what molecular hydrogen has at the temperature of around 4,000 Kelvin, pressure of around 40 uh, gigapascals. Uh, notice that this is a much, uh, sorry, four gigapascals. Notice that that's a much lower pressure than the region that we normally think of as metallic hydrogen. Remarkably, uh, this interpretation works for Saturn. So it works for both Jupiter and Saturn, and the difference with Saturn, of course, is that the gravitational acceleration is roughly three times less, so you have to go roughly three times deeper to reach the same conditions. And so the depth of the uh, zonal flows on Saturn is about nine or 10,000 kilometers, which enables it to be more closely a flow on cylinders. A wonderful story emerging from that. Let me turn now to the magnetic field. Uh, first, a reminder uh, shown here in the magnitude of the field uh, that what we knew before Juno was a structure that had just low harmonics, but then what Juno gave us is a field that is much more precisely determined. Uh, here is a figure from uh, Kimmy Moore's paper published re recently in Nature, which shows that the structure of the field is complicated. It's shown here at several different choices for the radius at which you can downward uh, continue the field that we observe from the spacecraft. But what's striking here are these patches of uh, concentrated flux, both positive and negative, uh, uh, adjacent to the pole. And if you prefer looking at magnetic field lines, this is another way to represent it. And the bottom figure, for example, is showing field lines that uh, emerge from one flux patch and into the other. This is different from the Earth. As shown here is Jupiter on the left, the Earth on the right, uh, at the core mantle boundary for the non-dipole field. And you can see some striking differences. In the case of the Earth, uh, to be sure, there are these flux patches but they're all over the place. In the case of Jupiter, they're less uh, frequent. 
uh, the northern hemisphere is different from the southern hemisphere, uh, this is not yet understood. This is a challenge for the future. What is this telling us about the dynamo? You would like to think it's telling us the outer radius at which the dynamo action is taking place. But that's a hard thing to decide. Uh, for example, a magnetic Reynolds number of 1,000 would be a plausible value at 89% at of the radius, magnetic Reynolds number perhaps 10 at 93% of the radius, depending, of course, on the convective motions that we don't know. But more seriously, the zonal flow, the east-west flow, can have a big effect on the field, producing toroidal field from which poloidal field can be produced. And so we're confronted here with a situation very different from the way we think about Earth's dynamo, which has a brick wall defining its outer boundary. We don't really know the convective motions. We don't know the zonal flow with precision at that region. Perhaps we can learn more about this by understanding the secular variation. And I urge you to come to the session this afternoon, P23A, where Kimmy Moore will talk about that. So briefly, a quick tour from the outside of the planet to the center of the planet, uh, shown here. Uh, on the left is the radius you're at and the various conditions. As you go down from the atmosphere already, when you're 1,000 kilometers down from the atmosphere, the temperature has gone up by about an order of magnitude. Um, the material, however, is still an ideal gas. And that's the region in which the uh, microwave radiometer gives us information. But then you go into the region, um, which is still only a few thousand kilometers down, where you get truncation of the zonal flow. Going down much deeper still, you get to the region which is the traditional notion of the metallic region of Jupiter, but it's abundantly clear now that this is not the correct way to think about Jupiter. And then all the way down to the terra incognita at the center of the planet. What's next? We want to get the precession constant from which we get the moment of inertia. We want to learn from the tides raised on Jupiter by Io a bit more about the dynamics of the planet. And of course, we want to know the water. Uh, we want to get a better understanding of the magnetic field structure. And from all of this, build a coherent story of the dynamics combining gravity, magnetic field, and MWR data. Getting up close to Jupiter, as we have, uh, has turned out to be an invaluable way of learning these essential ideas uh, of the formation and how this planet works. But of course, we're still working on this, uh, and this is a story that will be continued. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. We have time for a few questions. Um, yeah, uh, make sure to go to the mic. So I have a question if there is none. Uh, okay, Jonathan Lenin has the first question. <laughs> okay. So you referred to the um, diffuse boundary to the core as something that was expected, but at least in Wall's paper, that boundary has to extend quite high in radius, and that, it seems to me, is something that wasn't expected or maybe difficult to do. So can you comment on that? Uh, you are right that um, I may have... Uh, given an incorrect impression about the correspondence between what we think we have found and what models suggested. Uh, it does, of course, depend on the accretion fluxes, uh, the rate at which the ratio of solids to gas changes as you progress from primarily accreting solids to primarily accreting gases. And I think this is a, a challenge for the future. Um, there are, in fact, problems still with the interior models. And so I'm not myself entirely satisfied with where we are with what's going on into the deep interior. It's certainly the case that in those models by Sean Wall, uh, the mixing is out to 
about 50% of the radius. It's not uh, clear whether that is explained by the accretion process or whether it's uh, explained by the subsequent mixing, the convective stirring of the material uh, to a higher uh, radii. Uh, I, I think also that this relates to the whole question of where the enrichment in the atmosphere comes from. Is this material that's actually been dredged up from the interior? I actually think that's unlikely. Uh, but we need a better understanding of what uh, the source is for the material that, gave, that gives the, the freefold enrichment of heavy elements in the atmosphere. All right, thank you, Dave. Thank you, speaker, once again. And uh, while Andy Ingersoll is working his way up here, I would like to ask you, uh, you know, given the lights here uh, shining on the stage for the uh, video recording, it'll be easy to identify questions if you walk to the microphone uh, at the end of the talk. It'll also speed up the Q&A. Uh, so the next talk is the, on the meteorology of Jupiter, impact of the Juno data. It's an invited talk to be given by Andy Ingersoll. Right. Um, broadly speaking, the Juno mission uh, for atmospheric science was unique in two ways. Uh, one was the polar orbit. Uh, we, no spacecraft had ever spent much time flying over the poles, and Juno did and does and is flying over the poles. And the other is that it carried a microwave radiometer and uh, the microwave radiometer collected thermal photons from, uh, well, I'd say uh, 100 bars pressure, uh, but the tail end of the weighting functions go deeper than that, and uh, gave us knowledge of the structure <coughs> an order of magnitude deeper in pressure space than we'd ever seen before. <coughs> so uh, I'm going to really... Uh, talk more about the first one. I, I'm not, I'm going to start with the first one and go on to the second one in my talk. So, see if I operate this slide. Whoa. Now you've seen an early version of this plot uh, in uh, just from the first perigeove. Uh, the microwave radiometer collects most of its data in the hour during the uh, close flybys, uh, um, and the perigeove occurs near the equator, so we get better data near the equator, although that is going to change, and we're going to get uh, our best data at higher and higher latitudes, and that's a very good thing as this mission wears on. Uh, however, this is an update. Uh, what you're seeing is the average of eight perigeoves, and uh, what you're seeing in is, is uh, ammonia distribu distributed uh, versus pressure. Uh, you'll notice 10 bars is here, 100 bars is here. Uh, this is mostly, well, of course, Scott had the I insight. Uh, Mike uh, had the insight and uh, oversaw the building of the equipment, and Chung Lee did uh, most of the data analysis that we use here. Um, and um, the actually, uh, let me correct an implication that Dave had. In fact, before Galileo, we knew there was sort of a uh, depletion of ammonia from uh, radio observations from Earth down in this range of, uh, down maybe even to 10 bars pressure. But the structure down here, the deep, deep mixing ratio uh, is a Juno discovery. And you'll notice there is structure down here. And this is the average of eight perigeoves, and that structure exists in each of those perigeoves, and it is repeatable, in other words. Uh, and it's related to the belts and zones, which are the uh, features that we see up at uh, one half bar pressure. Uh, and the shading here. Uh, uh, the, the gray 
areas are where the wind structure at the half bar level, plus or minus a factor of two, is uh, cyclonic, and the white areas are where it's anticyclonic in both hemispheres. And you can see, it's not very good, but you know, welcome to the real world, but there's a suggestion of a correlation between cyclonic, anticyclonic, and little pinpricks upward here, and uh, not so good over here. Uh, now, uh, so that's really interesting, and it's a new thing. What uh, is in the first Parajov data, which was in the paper by Scott Bolton et al., uh, is this uh, high ammonia region uh, close to the equator, maybe uh, zero to five degrees latitude. And uh, we're going to use that because the ammonia in this region is closest to being constant with depth. Uh, <coughs> that is the best place for assuming that you have a convection and uh, well-mixed ammonia with depth, and therefore the best place where you have to assume <laughs> that you know the temperature profile. And so uh, we're going to, as I'll tell you, we're going to assume it's the moist adiabat, and uh, the moist adiabat depends on the water abundance, the, the actual detailed profile of temperature versus pressure depends on how much water you have. And it's that sort of back door that we have to use, because ammonia is the dominant microwave absorber here, it's that back door that we have to use to get the water abundance. Okay, uh, here's what Galileo showed for the ammonia abundance. Pressure along the horizontal axis. Uh, mixing ratio in parts per million. The solar value according to one determination of the solar value, I think uh, it's 2009 Aspland. Um, really, the, uh, it, it sort of asymptoted, if that's a verb, uh, to a value of four, uh, depending on whether you use the mass spectrometer in Galileo or the radio attenuation. Uh, it asymptoted uh, much deeper than the ammonia cloud. So there was a delay in the measured increase of ammonia. Uh, somewhat mysterious, actually. Uh, but this is at least uh, uh, collab uh, um, uh, agreeing with the, uh, what had been detected from radio observations from Earth. Water, here's the solar water abundance. And the Galileo probe mass spectrometer showed depletion of water, although it was rising. And who knows, maybe this is part of a delay if we had gone deeper, but the probe was not made to go deeper. If we'd gone deeper, way out here somewhere, it might have risen to four times solar also. So uh, as Dave said, that was a, a big uh, uh, objective of our mission. Uh, but the Galileo probe, which is this band here, here's solar composition for all these elements. Uh, noble gases, this was a big surprise. Um, here, here's uh, nitrogen, carbon, water, whoops, depleted, and sulfur and phosphorus all coming in, weighing in at around three, four times solar. And the surprise was the noble gases are also enriched relative to solar composition. Why is that a surprise? Well, you have to, during the formation of the planet, presumably, if that's what this reflects, you have to separate the noble gases from the hydrogen and helium, and they all want to be gases unless you go out to where the temperature is 30 Kelvin or something. Uh, and uh, so that was a surprise. How do you separate the noble gases from the hydrogen? and get uh, enrichment of those noble gases. In fact, uh, here's sort of a summary of that. Here's the enrichment factors, uh, primordial argon, not argon, 40. Uh, and here's the uh, big question mark, what's the O to H ratio on, on Jupiter? Uh, there are theories. Uh, if you take interstellar grains, amorphous ice 
from 20 uh, to 30 kelvins, which you have to collect out beyond 40 AU, uh, you might expect the O to H to be about the same as the C to H and about the same as the argon to H. Uh, on the other hand, maybe you don't have to go out that far, go out that cold in temperature. Uh, if you have a lot of water around, uh, the water could trap the noble gases as clathrates, but you'd need a lot of water. And uh, there is even a theory that carbon-rich particles uh, could trap the noble gases if the O to H is very low. So we have a lot of theories. Uh, and of course, uh, all this is relevant to the Earth's uh, big depletion in uh, volatiles, but I won't go into that. So, uh, as I said, we're going to use this uh, as a sort of first uh, quantitative assessment of the water. Only at this latitude, we're going to use this region here where we think we have a best chance so far of measuring, of, of knowing the temperature profile which we need to interpret everything else. Uh, here's that same region over eight perijoves, and it does vary. Uh, the enrichment higher up is uh, still to TBD, TB, to be U, U stands for understood, to be understood. Uh, and here's the result. This is Cheng Li's uh, Monte Carlo approach. Uh, here's, well, these are both synthetic analyses where taking into account all the noise that we think we know, instrument noise as well as planet noise, variability on uh, the eight perijoves, uh, but the model takes into account that noise and assumes, in this model assumes two times solar values of O to H, and this assumes six times solar values of O to H, and uh, there's a degeneracy, uh, this is the ammonia mixing ratio, this is 2.7 right there, and uh, there's a degeneracy between ammonia and water, not too serious, but this is the one sigma level and this is the uh, two sigma level, and here it is again, and uh, if you just sum these vertically, you get the lower curves, and here's what you get when you take the real data. And uh, it sort of looks like this. <laughs> and then here's the one sigma and the two sigma. Uh, and I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, because there's a TBD to be, to be continued as we move to higher latitudes and start uh, developing estimates of what's going on there. Changing gears. Lightning. I'll tell you about the, uh, the high latitude uh, looks that we have in a moment. Here's Voyager, here's Galileo, and here's uh, Juno. There are four instruments on Juno that are detecting lightning. One is the camera. These data, uh, these two, Voyager and Galileo, are cameras. Uh, you actually see the lightning on the night side. Um, and uh, this is a uh, heavy line is the microwave radiometer, uh, although it doesn't have uh, the same spatial resolution as a, a camera. Uh, it does see lightning and does tell you roughly where the lightning is coming from. And this is 50 degrees north. Uh, and that asymmetry is remarkable given that it has persisted from Voyager days uh, through the Galileo days, although uh, the southern hemisphere at 50 degrees latitude uh, uh, came up during Galileo days. Voyager really didn't look in the southern hemisphere. These big boxes are uh, where Voyager uh, took data. Uh, these very faint figures here also, two peaks, one at plus 50, one at minus. The, these two peaks are whistlers detected by the radio wave uh, instrument on Juno. 
uh, and this is a busy slide, but uh, when you interpret whistlers, you don't exactly know where they came from, but these orange things are where the uh, whistlers were coming from. And I'm not quite sure whether there is a bias, uh, Jack can explain better than I can, whether there is a bias in uh, where the, all the whistlers are naturally going to be detected at high latitudes or not. We move on from that. Uh, the last instrument uh, that detects lightning is the stellar reference unit. And uh, that's a camera uh, used uh, to navigate the spacecraft against the stars behind it. And uh, this is the uh, Juno data from the SRU. And uh, this is uh, data from Galileo. And we seem to be extending the uh, uh, distribution of power or not power, energy of fl visible energy of the lightning flashes. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't measure power so much as you measure the total energy that came in a flash. Uh, uh, we're extending uh, that to lower energy, as you can see here. And by the way, uh, I, I keep putting advertisements for people's talks. Uh, and this is the afternoon talk at 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, today. All right. Uh, and th here is the poster talk uh, on Wednesday. But um, Galileo camera, Juno cam, has detected these wavy, wispy clouds, also at 50 degrees latitude. Uh, Glenn Orton will tell you, explain it all, of course, how it's related. No, uh, he won't probably, how it's related to lightning. But these are new phenomena, and uh, we need a theory, an atmospheric theory, that explains all of this data at once. Lightning depths to 100 kilometers, uh, but we're not there yet, of course. All right. Uh, another, it's not a new thing, but it's, we're collecting more useful data about these little waves. They're uh, mesoscale waves, very faint, so I want you to look carefully, but uh, uh, Glenn and Candy, these people, uh, have put little markers to, so you can see them. Um, they were discovered by Voyager, and uh, Voyager uh, measured a wavelength of about 300 kilometers. I personally favor, although I can't say, that they are uh, evidence of a Kelvin-Helmholtz instability, basically a shear instability where one vertical layer, one horizontal layer rubs against uh, one above or below it but other people think they could be radiating from convective events, and that's also possible. Gravity waves radiating away from convection. Okay, <clears throat> now, I said uh, one of the great things Juno did for atmospheric science was to pass over the poles. And uh, this is a Juno cam image, of course it was this is a single image. It was dark on one side because this is a terminator and we're at very high latitudes. That is indeed the pole. This big circle is 80 degrees north latitude, uh, south latitude. And here is a uh, GRAM, that's the Juno infrared radiometer mapper. And it's <laughs> the same, I, I'm not very good at acronyms. Um, it's the same moment in time, and you can see a bright cl cloud here and a bright cloud here. Presumably it's cloudy and bright, and clouds are bright. And that same thing is dark in the infrared, meaning it's indeed a high structure because it's cold up there and infrared always looks uh, uh, dark uh, when it's looking at high cloud structures. And, so these two and these two are the same thing. Uh, 
You can also see which way these things are going around if you think of a pinwheel. There's, uh, these are the, uh, and this is the southern hemisphere, these are the little trailing arms of the pinwheel extending outwards as if the pinwheel is wrapping them up, uh, which means they're rotating clockwise and which means they're low pressure centers, they're cyclones, not anti-cyclones. And all six of these guys, five Pentagon and the center one, are cyclones. Um, in fact, here's the other hemisphere. This is the northern hemisphere where there's an octagon and uh, indeed it's going counterclockwise. It's a cyclone. Um, and uh, these cyclones have enough individuality and it's persistent that you can track them over several perijoves, and uh, people have been doing that. And there'll be a talk this afternoon on that. And we are modeling them. Uh, well, this is actually uh, an old paper, a laboratory study of something called vortex crystals. Kelvin, when he was named Thompson, uh, studied vortex crystals. Uh, floating magnets on pools of water. And so this is one simulation. This is another one with slightly different initial conditions. And it evolved to a totally different thing. But this is 2D Euler equations, totally incompressible horizontal flow. And if you put this on a, a sphere, rotating sphere, round rotating sphere, it's no longer 2D and there's lots more going on. And uh, this talk has wonderful movies, shallow water, uh, and it's possible that it'll appear this afternoon as well. And we got a, quite a wide variety of behaviors here. And I'll just show you my favorite one, not a movie, but a, a three-step a three -step movie. Here's an initial pentagon. Here's a uh, intruder. And because we're on a rotating sphere, cyclones drift toward the pole. The middle panel, the intruder is over here, bumping this guy into the center. And they, they repel, they bounce. And this guy gets bounced into the center. And then it settles down to a very uh, lovely, stable integration that lasts for several simulated years. And that's the end, and I, again, plug this session today and this session on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. So if we uh, have some, we have time for questions. If you could uh, move to the microphone. And before you start, uh, I'd like to ask a question, uh, Andy. The uh, correlation with the preponderance of lightning at northern mid-latitudes, it's kind of hard to ignore that the magnetic field is very strong at northern mid-latitudes. Do, do you see any possibility for a connection there? <clears throat> On Earth, charge separation uh, occurs near the freezing level, where you have all three phases, gas, uh, liquid and solid interacting with each other. And uh, that's a reasonable assumption. In fact, it could tell us about the water abundance, but it's not very deep. It's five to, depending on the water abundance, it's five to 10 bars pressure. So I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was thinking in terms of, of uh, a connection between the magnetic field at, at depth perhaps stabilizing uh, or destabilizing atmosphere above. But in any case, we'll go to, uh, I think that's Glenn Horton yes, out there is. for a question. Yeah, a question or a comment mostly. One of the intriguing things about that northern cyclone is that it has this interior anti-cyclone as a very compact region in the middle, and that's really a, a mystery. Yeah, watch carefully, and you'll see it's right at the center. It's spinning the other way. Yeah, just That's a very dark thing saying. with a white core. 
any case, but you're right about the... Welcome the, the to fil fluid mechanics. Yeah, that, that <laughs> fil that filigreed region you showed at, at the first part of the polar stuff is, is really intriguing. It's going to be, uh, I don't think it's associated with lightning at all. It's very high uh, altitude material, and it's kind of a combination of all the things that lay down uh, particles around that auroral uh, oval and that, that uh, uh, polar hood extended much further down, and that's probably a detector of dynamics in the stratosphere, which we've never had before. Yeah, shallow water uh, model is the simplest nonlinear fluid model that captures Coriolis forces and uh, stratification. It's strictly horizontal wrapped on a sphere, and uh, we have not yet done a 3D model. It takes a lot of computer time, and uh, uh, we really have not produced these vortices, we've just dropped them in and let them evolve with time. Okay, do we have another question? I do. Oh, uh, we do. Joe, sorry, <laughs> Jonathan. <laughs> Can I have the microphone? Nice. Okay, it's, it's just a comment. Uh, first of all, the noble gases are actually not all volatile. Argon has the volatility of N2 and krypton has the volatility of methane. They're noble because they don't chemically react. But the, the, um, there are other models besides the one that you had uh, listed in terms of trapping. And one of them that's an interesting one is if the C to O ratio in the disk is slightly elevated, you still have water ice. You can trap these materials in the water ice, but you don't require as high a ratio of water. In fact, you can't have as high a ratio of water relative to these others in order to explain the pattern. But we have to find the water first before we can argue about this, so. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank, don't go that way. Do we have uh, another question? No, we had, be that. careful. Uh, it's, it's better to approach the stage and leave from this side where there are stairs than unless this side unless where unless there is a, Andy, a precipitous yeah. drop. All right. So uh, let's thank Andy again. For the thank you, Andy. So we move on to the next, uh, again, of invited talk. Uh, this is by Barry Mark, the Applied Physics Laboratory. And the title of the talk is Jupiter's Surprising Space Environments as Revealed by the Juno Mission. Okay, a change of direction here. I'm going to be talking about Jupiter's space environment as opposed to its uh, atmosphere and, uh, and interior structure. Uh, there's been a lot of surprise, just like we find in the interior and the atmosphere, a lot of surprises, uh, things that we just did not expect based on, uh, based on uh, previous findings. I'm going to talk about, uh, okay, first of all, I'm going to be representing six different instruments uh, here. There's the magnetometer uh, instrument, uh, the low energy particle instrument called Jade, the higher energy particle instrument called JEDI. There's a plasma wave instrument. There are two imagers, the UVS and the GERM instrument that do imaging of the, uh, uh, of the aurora uh, regions. And so uh, this talk, I've got a lot to cover, uh, talking about all of those different uh, 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 result from all of those different instruments. I am going to be talking about very briefly about uh, two, uh, two different regions. The first region is the outer uh, space environment of Jupiter. Juno approached uh, Jupiter uh, with this long trajectory coming in from the dawn side. It, uh, it crossed the boundaries, uh, uh, a, a shock wave, and then the magnetopause boundary on its way uh, uh, on its way into getting into this uh, uh, this dawn side large uh, orbit. On its way in, it did see uh, Jupiter is essentially filling up this region with uh, uh, with ions coming from Jupiter. I don't have time to talk about that, but it's a very different characteristic than than Voyager saw. I am going to focus on a couple of. Uh, uh, findings just outside the uh, bow shock, which is called the hot flow anomaly, and then what we saw right at the magnetopause uh, 
boundary. Right at the magnetopause, we, we uh, saw very, very clear indications of what's called magnetic reconnection, for those who are not familiar. At Earth, magnetic reconnection is a very important energy conversion process, whereby uh, magnetic field lines within the interplanetary region connect up to the field lines of the, uh, of the uh, magnetosphere, very important conversion process, a, a, a way in which energies within the interplanetary environment get into the magnetosphere, power the aurora regions, power the generation of the radiation belts. At Jupiter, we expected a very little magnetic reconnection because of the weakness of the interplanetary magnetic field and other plasma parameters. So we were somewhat surprised to see that magnetic re reconnection was very clearly observed at Jupiter. This is an observation uh, published by uh, Rob Ebert et al., where we expect plasma jetting right at this magnetopause. Uh, Rob saw a very clear indication of that plasma jetting right when you had this in, uh, uh, rotation of the magnetic field. So we're somewhat surprised to see that, and it may be an important element in how the solar wind is impacting the, uh, uh, the aurora and other regions, even though it's a rotationally driven magnetosphere. There's another phenomenon that I'm not going to try to describe to you very well. It's called the hot flow uh, anomaly phenomena. This is what it looks like in the data, and I'm not going to be going over that. What I wanted to indicate is that there have been recent results that su suggest this is a very important process for energizing uh, particles uh, uh, upstream of the, uh, of the bow shock region. And what Juno found is by far the very largest hot flow anomaly. It's an interplanetary disturbance caused by the interaction with the, with the uh, shock very, very much larger hot flow anomaly than was observed at any other planet. And it, it appears, based on this result, that the size of these structures scales with the size of the magnetosphere. That's about all I have time to do to talk about the dis more distant uh, space environment. I am going to move in to the polar regions. Juno was uh, the space environment instruments on Juno were primarily designed to investigate the polar regions of Jupiter's magnetosphere. Juno did fly over the poles of Jupiter. This trajectory is wiggly because it's in a magnetic coordinate system rather than in a planetary coordinate system. And you can see it comes, comes from the north, passes very, very close to the planet, and passes out uh, to the south here. And because of the wiggles, we do cross these magnetic field lines that connect to the auroral acceleration region uh, uh, multi uh, multiple times. When you take the, the spacecraft and, and uh, map it down to the planet along these magnetic field lines, you get, uh, you get a configuration like this where this oval-shaped object is the statistical auroral oval where we expect to see the bright auroral emissions. And this sort of pigtail plot shows you where the magnetic mapping of the Juno spacecraft crosses the aurora where it spends a lot of time in what I'll call the polar cap and then crosses the magnetosphere. And we've seen a number, I'm going to focus first on this polar cap region. Some people don't like the name polar cap, but I'm going to proceed to, to use it. A lot of surprises in this region. And first I'm going to talk about one surprise is the discovery of these megavolt electron beams coming out of the polar cap. So this is uh, Randy Gladstone's uh, UVS image of the aurora. And you can see how the trajectory of the spacecraft crosses the auroral oval passes into the polar cap region and then crosses the auroral oval again. In our energetic particle data, this is where we cross the auroral oval, this is that polar cap region, and this is the auroral oval uh, crossing again. What we found within the polar cap here is, is an electron beam coming out of the, uh, of the polar cap. The surprise about this is just how persistent this is. It essentially fills the polar cap, and this is true for all of the perijove encounters that we have. But e and, and it is very, very narrowly confined to the uh, magnetic field direction. This is pitch angle as a, uh, as a function of, uh, of the angle. But the even more surprising element of this is how energetic this is. It's, it, it's, this is pointing to a couple of the spectrum measured in here. They are power law distributions going above 1 MeV, and more recent measurement from Chris Peronicus and Heidi Becker have shown that they probably go to 10 MeV uh, uh, energies uh, occasionally. Very surprising that we can get that much energy into these electron beams. Other measurements that we've made into this polar cap region is shown uh, from a paper by uh, George Clark 
you can see that we spent a lot of time in this polar cap and what George found was that these very uh, narrow in energy proton structures and heavy ion structures and these are indicating magnetic field aligned potentials that are accelerating these protons down onto the atmosphere. Those potentials are greater than a megavolt and we've seen multiple megavolt potential. Sometimes we see upward electron acceleration but more commonly we see this downward proton acceleration. And the surprise here is just how large scale these structures is. It's if the large segments of the polar cap are at a megavolt and more potential with respect to the rest of the space environment, which is just somewhat surprising. When you look at lower energy particles, uh, Rob Ebert has found just a cornucopia of different, uh, of different uh, uh, regions and phenomena. The one thing that, uh, that I'm very interested in is this multiplicity of upward electron inverted Vs, this sort of forest of electron features that are indicated that electrons are being electrostatically accelerated away from the, uh, uh, from the polar cap and it's, the, it's the, uh, the high degree of structuring in, that, in those potentials that's, uh, that's very interesting. Wanted to uh, talk about uh, the auroral imaging that is done. This is a mission averaged image of the northern and southern uh, uh, auroral oval that we've seen. You see a lot of structure within these. Uh, by the way, the color here is there are different spectral bands in the UV imaging and this is colored according to the energy of the electrons that are, gener that are in fact generating uh, these auroral emissions. You for, for example see reddish regions which indicate very high energy electrons. You see bluish regions indicating uh, much lower energy electrons. One of the real surprises, however, is this red auroral region right in the middle, which is a rather bright feature indicating very high energy electrons must be uh, causing that. The problem with that is that we find that when this is for, this is a, for an individual auroral image, uh, Perigeo 5, where we saw a very clear example of this red aurora, and this is the trajectory, the map trajectory of Juno across that, we don't see nearly a enough downward energy flux to explain that uh, emission. These, uh, uh, the, the energy flux is for the downward direction and also the upward direction. Neither of these have enough energy flux in order to explain the brightness of the red aurora. Randy Gladstone has proposed that this aurora is in fact not generated by downward electrons but in fact due to the electric currents flowing within the ionosphere and, and stimulating from below these auroral emissions. And some uh, support for that finding is found when we look at, when we find that the, the brightness of this red aurora depends on solar illumination. So these, all of these images are all rotated, this was Fran Bagenal's idea, by the way, such that the sun is coming up from the below. So the sunshine in all of these cases is from the below, and these white lines are a very rough estimate of where the uh, uh, day-night boundary is. And what you find is that when the sun is illuminating the aurora, you get a very bright red aurora. When the sun is not illuminating the, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the polar cap region, you do not get that same feature. And this is, uh, is indicated that that uh, ionospheric conductivity is playing a very important role in the generation of this polar uh, red, red aurora, giving support, I think, to Randy's idea that this is an electric current process as opposed to an electron precipitation process. I'm going to move on to talking about the main aurora. I'm moving away from the, uh, from the polar cap and now looking at the main auroral uh, 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 region here. And I wanted to give you an idea of uh, what, we see, what we expected to see on Juno based on Earth physics. So this is a, a famous plot, it's very complicated, very famous plot from the FAST mission when the FAST spacecraft was passing through auroral regions at Earth. And there, although there's a lot of complexity here, there's two features I wanted to highlight here. One, this top plot is the east-west magnetic deflection associated with the electric currents that are flowing from the space environment to the ionosphere. And you can see there uh, associated with the auroral acceleration, there are magnetic deflections of a couple of hundred nanotesla uh, in those regions. The other feature I wanted to point is this is an energy spectrum uh, 
Uh, and what we expect to see, what we see at Earth and what we expected to see at Juno, are these monoenergetic electrons. These monoenergetic electrons are being accelerated by electrostatic potentials between the space environment and the ionosphere. So because Jupiter's aurora is so bright, and this is sort of the brightest mechanism for generating Earth aurora, we expected to see these magnet strong magnetic deflections and monoenergetic electron uh, distribution. Um, what we saw in the mag magnetometer data uh, of Jack is we did be, uh, see magnetic field aligned uh, currents uh, that are giving rise to east-west magnetic deflections. And this is, uh, this is uh, Stavros Kotsiaros' uh, uh, evaluation over many, many different orbits where along the trajectory of the spacecraft you see a color coding that is associated with the east and west deflection of the magnetometer. Those trajectories are overlaying the auroral, oval, the auroral observations of Randy Gladstone's UVS instrument, and there is definitely a correlation between the, the uh, auroral observations and the, uh, uh, and the magnetic deflection. The surprise is that these magnetic deflections in the southern hemisphere, in this case, are sort of comparable to the magnetic deflections that we saw at Earth, a couple of hundred nanotesla. Now, Jupiter's aurora is, has an intensity that's a full order of magnitude greater than Earth's, and the power in it is two orders of magnitude greater. So it's somewhat of a surprise to see such weak uh, mag uh, magnetic field uh, uh, deflections associated with these, uh, uh, these aurora, just from the scaling from what we know at Earth. What is even more surprising, however, is the north-south asymmetry that we see that. While uh, when you compare the southern uh, deflections, auroral deflections, with the northern uh, deflections, here's one trajectory, here's another, uh, another orbit, what we see in the north is magnetic deflections that might be 50 nanotesla rather than the 200 nanotesla that we see at Earth and the 1,000 nanotesla that we expect, in fact expected uh, at Jupiter. And so this is a real surprise that is not yet, that is not, uh, yet explained, why those electric currents are, are as weak as they are and why there is such a north-south asymmetry in those uh, electric currents. I'm going to move on to the, uh, the acceleration processes. This is what the energetic particles look like when we cross, do an auroral crossing. Uh, 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 it, this is the southern hemisphere, we're crossing the auroral oval in this case. This is that analog to the energy spectrum that I showed you for the Earth case as a function of time as we cross that aurora. We see none of that uh, monoenergetic electron uh, distributions. All of these electron distributions, even in very, very bright aurora, are very broadband. They're broadband distributions, and this was a surprise. We expected to see this electrostatic acceleration over the, um, as we cross through the auroral region. That, this is true both in the energetic particles that I'm showing you and also in the lower energy uh, particles. And again, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but these are some of the uh, spectra uh, electron spectra intensity is a function of energy that the jade instrument th uh, saw flying through these very same regions and again no indication of this electrostatic uh, uh, potential uh, that we uh, uh, that we expected to see another surprise of these electrons that are causing this intense aurora is the up down asymmetry so this is that same plot I showed you where I show you broadband electron distributions. When you plot the angles, these are the downward particles, these are the upward particles. And these uh, downward intensities are sufficient to explain this aurora. But what we find is very often the upward electron uh, uh, intensities are even brighter than the downward intensity. They are by at least an order of magnitude. So whatever these acceleration processes uh, are, they're in fact accelerating electrons away from Jupiter even more powerfully than they're accelerating electrons towards Jupiter. And that's true both for the, low, uh, the high energy uh, Jedi instrument and the lower energy uh, uh, jade uh, measurement. I've been showing these high energy and low energy uh, uh, examples of uh, measurements made in, in this rural acceleration region. We're starting to try to put these, uh, these two data sets together. Frederick Allegrini in particular is, is taking the lead on that. But I wanted to go back to this nice image from Randy Gladstone from the uh, 
uh, from the, and talk about the energy structure, the surprising energy structure within this main auroral region. Remember the red is high energy particles, blue is lower energy particles, and we sort of see a sandwich of, uh, of, uh, of emissions that are uh, somewhat surprising. The bluest regions correspond to lower energy electrons. The red regions correspond to the higher energy uh, electrons. And why you have a high, low, high is sort of an unanswered question. Uh, Frederick Allegrini has confirmed that indeed when he, for orbit by orbit by orbit, he's looking for the dominant energy, uh, electron energies that are causing that aurora. Indeed, sometimes we find very high energy elect electrons responsible, other times very low energy electrons. He finds some regions that are dominated even at the kilovolt region, which is a, is a sort of a surprise based on pre-Juno uh, uh, pre uh, measurements. We eventually did find electrostatic potentials that are accelerating uh, auroral electrons along the magnetic field. So this is a case where we're crossing this bright auroral, uh, uh, auroral region here. This is the electron distributions. Uh, the energy is a function of time, is a function of intensity. And sometimes we do see these monoenergetic uh, uh, electron distribution indicating uh, electrostatic acceleration downward onto the aurora. In fact, you can see from this individual vertical slice through here that we're seeing, in this particular case, we're seeing electrostatic potentials of 100 kilovolt. We've seen them up to about 400 kilovolt. And so, yes, Jupiter is generating these magnetic field line electric potentials. They're participating in auroral acceleration. The surprise is that even when they're present, and even given their potential values that are an order of magnitude greater than Earth's, the energy, downward energy flux is still modest compared to the downward energy flux that we see during the broadband uh, distribution. So right when we're seeing this inverted V uh, electrostatic potential, we're seeing modest downward uh, energy fluxes. When we go into the broadband acceleration region, we're seeing <coughs> much higher values of the, of the downward energy flux. This really is a, a magnetosphere or uh, an auroral region dominated by the broadband acceleration processes as opposed to the, the coherent electrostatic uh, acceleration. There was a hint in this first observation that there may be a transition between uh, coherent electrostatic acceleration and the broadband acceleration, and we saw very spe very specific evidence for that kind of evolution in this case, where again we're crossing the bright auroral regions uh, as a function of time. We see the development of this inverted V structure with, with um, electrostatic potentials up to 200 kilovolts in this region. Right in the center of that you get a broadband acceleration. It's like this electrostatic region became unstable and, and some broadband acceleration process turned on right in the middle uh, of this structure. And when that happened, the energy fluxes went up by, downward energy fluxes went up by a factor of three. So again, even given the presence of the, of the electrostatic potential, the broadband acceleration is even brighter. It's even more energetic than the downward uh, acceleration. Uh, <coughs> uh, Bill Kurth, uh, by the way, has, has looked at the plasma wave experiment during this inverted V and broadband acceleration, and he saw that during the broadband acceleration, right in the middle of this structure, that the wave experiment became very, very intense. I think he may have sent it, said it's more intense than, uh, than most other regions that he's invented, uh, that he's visited. Um, the surprise is that this is composed of, there is maybe an alphonic component. People think about alphane waves as possibly uh, causing auroral acceleration at Earth. This clearly has a, br a broad Whistler mode uh, a participation in this acceleration. And there's a paper by, uh, by Sadie Elliott uh, on Wednesday morning that will talk about how Whistler waves may be able to uh, accelerate uh, 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 auroral particles. But this is, uh, like I said, at Earth uh, we think about alphonic acceleration, that's what people talk about. I have not heard people talk about Whistler mode acceleration, and that may be an important component or difference between Ju uh, Jupiter and, uh, and Earth, remains to be seen. Wanted to uh, talk about another aspect. This is that same inverted V that I have been talking about uh, here on the right-hand uh, side here. 
But two minutes before that, we saw something that was just the opposite. We saw a downward ion inverted V. And this is an inverted V uh, caused by an electrostatic potential that is accelerating ions downward. And that electric field has a polarity such that it's trying to keep the electrons away from the ionosphere. So you would expect uh, almost no auroral acceleration associated with this because the electric field is in the wrong direction. But what we find is that the downward energy fluxes, uh, uh, downward electron energy fluxes in this region are just as bright as they are in the uh, region where the electric field is trying to accelerate the electrons downward. And it does appear that at least in certain cases the downward energy flux do not seem to care whether the potentials are upward and downward whether the electric currents are upward and downward, because these electrostatic potentials must be associated with, with two different polarities of the electric current. And this may feed back to the surprises we've had in the magnetic deflections associated with, um, associated with the rural, uh, 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 associated with rural acceleration, that uh, maybe the auroral regions are somewhat decoupled from uh, from the energetics of the magnetic field line uh, current. I can see I'm running out of time uh, quickly. I wanted to talk about the fact that there's another aspect of auroral, um, uh, of auroral uh, physics that is uh, very important. That is that uh, these auroral these regions also generate radio waves, and I think Bill was talking about that through the cyclotron maser instability, and Juno did fly right through that cyclotron maser instability region, which is right where this vertex, uh, by the way, I think I mislabeled uh, what, what this line is. This is the cyclotron frequency. And so where these V-shaped regions touch down onto the uh, cyclotron frequency, that's where we pass into the cyclotron uh, maser instability region, according to uh, Kerr's paper. The surprise here is that sometimes the cyclotron uh, maser instability seems to be driven by electron conics, and I think uh, Bill has told me that that has not been observed at Earth, and so it's, uh, that is somewhat of a surprise. I uh, wanted to talk very quickly, and I'm running out of time quickly here. I'm sorry. This is an auroral image taken by the GERM experiment in infrared. And yes, the GERM uh, uh, auroral emissions do look somewhat different than the UV ones. And uh, that has been documented by a nice paper by Gerard et al., where the emission processes do seem to be different. What I wanted to focus here is on this uh, region that is right uh, south of the, uh, of the auroral region, which is the Io. Uh, is the region of Io. Uh, and so these are emissions associated with the moon Io. And what was discovered is that the amount of structuring in that Io-related aurora is much, much, um, uh, uh, mo there's much more structure than we anticipated based on theory. The theories are based on alphanic waves that are bouncing back and forth between hemispheres. This structuring is much greater than can be explained by um, by those alphonic bouncing, and we need new physics uh, in order to explain that. In the much more distant region, uh, we see a bifurcation of the, uh, of the tail, which was, again, not, not predicted. When Juno flies across this tail, uh, the plasma sensor, the jade plasma sensor can make measurements, and they see the same kind of bifurcation in the plasma measurement that the GERM uh, uh, experiment was seen in the uh, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the infrared uh, measurement. What is interesting about these measurements is the plasma uh, instrument is seeing broadband electron acceleration that is causing these IO-related uh, aurora. Pre-Juno, we did expect that these to be electrostatically accelerated once again mm -hmm. to cause the IO uh, uh, emissions, where in fact these are once again uh, uh, once again, very broadband. I can see I'm way out of time. I was going to talk about the array, some, some result from the radiation experiment. Yeah, another minute, right ahead of okay, another, oh, yeah, a little ahead of a schedule. Yeah. I wanted, okay, I'm going to go on and have three slides on the radiation uh, uh, regions. Uh, here is the, was the discovery of a heavy ion radiation belt right at the Jupiter's equator. Uh, when, when Juno flies through this region, it sees the regular horns of the radiation belt. It sees the regular horns of the radiation belt on the north and south. What we discovered was this radiation region right in the middle. This is analogous to the radiation region that Don Mitchell talked about at, uh, at Saturn. This peculiar energy structure is, is real. 
and Peter Coleman has used that energy structure to confirm that this, indeed, this region is indeed populated by energetic neutral atoms coming from the outer region. As they pass over this region, they get stripped by the upper atmosphere and turn into charged particles and populate these uh, inner regions. And again, I think it's analogous to what, Sa uh, what uh, Cassini was seeing at Saturn. Wanted to talk about uh, Heidi Becker's results where we pass through these horns of the radiation belt. This is the horns of the radiation belt. This is the horns of the radiation belt. What Heidi he found was that the um, uh, uh, intensity of the radiation belts are about seem to be about an order of magnitude less than the pre-Juno expectations. It is important to know that this is the radiation in the horns of the radiation belt. It does not tell us that the radiation near the equator is any weaker than we expected. It's just the the amount of the radiation that extends to the high latitude. We know now, based on Heidi's result, that it, it's a lot weaker. I'll just show one more result, uh, which is, again, Heidi Becker's use of the star cameras on Juno to investigate the, uh, uh, the radiation region. And what Heidi discovered is a very peculiar feature within the image plane of the star cameras that just could not be explained by electrons or even light ions. It turns out that the best explanation, it's about 100 MeV per nucleon heavy ions that are existing within the horns uh, of the radiation belt. And as far as I know, the, the existence of these heavy ions is completely unexplained at this, uh, at this point, uh, uh, point in time. And I think I'm just going to stop there and thank for the extra minute. Or, uh, thank minute. you, Barry. I, I did want to say, just I'll take a 10 more seconds, that there are a lot of surprises in Jupiter's magnetosphere that we d simply did not have, I did not have time to talk about here. And I've sort of listed the ones that I did not talk about uh, on this final slide. So I'll you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we do have a few minutes for questions, and I see someone at the microphone. Glenn? Glenn Orton again. Um, fully, being fully aware that correlation does not equate to causation, it's still intriguing that the high energy uh, UV radiation inside the auroral oval uh, is coincident with what we're seeing, at least broadly, with the spatial uh, orientation where we see both X ray uh, emission and mid infrared emission, which is coming just from heating in the atmosphere. So a big picture that would pull us all together would be interesting. The stuff in the miniaturite is much further down in the atmosphere and it's uh, variation with the uh, solar uh, activity dropping off is, does not coincide, it's not at all coincident what we're seeing. I think it's that, that emission from the, the UV is more or less constant. So there's a Yeah, puzzle, I know, I know that there. Randy has, uh, has put his x-ray um, uh, measurements on top of the same images and, and there's no question on the, uh, on the day side uh, uh, emissions uh, or at least on the, on the region where you expect this magnetic cusp region you, you have a lot of the x-rays and they aren't quite correlated of course with the, uh, with the red aurora that I showed. You, we have time for one final question. I think that's Andy. It is Mike? Andy. You convinced us that there are a lot of surprises about the field aligned currents and the uh, electric fields flipping up and down. Are there theories about it? Can you summarize them in one word? Well, uh, <laughs> my, my own feeling is because of Galileo measurements and other measurements in the distant magnetosphere, the total amount of current needs to be what we th thought it was going to be. It's how those currents are, uh, the currents that close in the ionosphere are distributed. I think that the electric currents are somewhat decoupled from the auroral emissions. Uh, and, and so that you, you may have, the, uh, the electric current regions may be much broader than the auroral emission region because we do see some decoupling of those. Uh, of those. And you're shaking your head and you don't believe a word of it. <laughs> okay, thanks again, Barry. Okay, and the, uh, the next talk, uh, also an invited talk um, by Candy Hansen, uh, and she'll be speaking, the title of the talk is Images of Jupiter, Science uh, and Art. Okay, 
Wait, which keyboard and which? So it's that keyboard, and uh, you can use the mouse. There is actually, it shows up as a point of brain slice. OK, thank you. Uh, I will be talking about uh, data from three of the remote sensing instruments, the uh, Stellar Reference Unit, which is actually our star tracker, the GIRAM, and um, the JunoCam. And mostly I'll be showing JunoCam data because that's the one I'm responsible for. Uh, the JunoCam is actually uh, our outreach instrument, which happens to also do some science. Uh, but because it was on the payload to, as a means of giving the public a way to participate in a meaningful way on a science mission, uh, we have no imaging team. Or, the way I like to think about it, we have a global virtual imaging team. And so uh, we don't do, uh, we don't have any professionals processing the data. Rather, we have a community of uh, amateurs and so on each of these images that I'll show I'm going to indicate the uh, credit of the person who did the work. Now I'm not really going to talk about the intersection of science and art rather I'm going to show you. And so uh, to begin um, on the far left are is a lightly processed JunoCam image, and this is what we post on the web uh, for the world to pick up. And you can see, going from left to right, that uh, that, that, that is our transition uh, from science to art. Uh, and where do you draw the line? Um, I gave up. I actually just gave up on where to draw the line. Uh, I want to point out this particular piece of an image. Um, Gerald Eichstadt has figured out experimentally how to remove a phase function so that the illumination from the limb to the terminator is flat. Quite often, someone else, and you'll see a lot of Sean Doran's uh, work, uh, will pick up on Gerald's uh, rendition and then um, make it into more of an artistic product. And then on the far right, you get to things that you might want to hang on your wall in your living room. And I will claim that this is not only wonderful for the world, it's wonderful for scientists to see Jupiter in a rather different light. Because I deal with imaging experiments, lighting is everything to me. And so I guess I'm the only person who actually put in a trajectory plot in their, in their talk. Uh, but um, here's our 53-day uh, orbit. We come around, the spacecraft comes around, it spends a lot of time far away from Jupiter. But then uh, in the last uh, hour before Perijove, before closest approach, you can see this is where we do our dive. Uh, and it takes us just two hours to get from perched over the North Pole to a position perched over the South Pole. And so we have these wonderful uh, low emission angle images of the North and the South Poles, and then we have very high resolution images um, at Perijove. The uh, orbit of Juno is evolving as time goes on. When we got into orbit, we were in approximately a 90 degree phase angle. So uh, with the tail pedal of the orbit oriented about 90 degrees from the direction to the sun. As time has gone on, the orbit has evolved, and now we're up around here. Um, and so Apajove is headed to midnight. Um, and what that means is that we come in from the dark side, and uh, we pass over the North Pole, and make a, um, our pass is then on the daylight sunlit uh, hemisphere. The orbit is also evolving to the south, which um, means that our closest approach point is evolving to the north. And so we are getting higher resolution images. Uh, on every pass, we are moving northward and getting higher resolution images, but spending less time there. Whereas uh, in the south, as the, as the spacecraft recedes from the planet, we get these long views 
um, that lasts many hours uh, to observe the South Pole. Uh, just one more sort of thing about how to understand what you're looking at. <laughs> um, so Juno Kim has about a 58 degree field of view. On the left, you can see here we are over the North Pole and we are seeing the entire planet. When we get close, and this is not to scale, of course we get even closer yet, um, we just see a little swath up very, very close. And so that's what those images tend to look like. And then outbound, uh, finally, we get to the point where we're seeing all of Jupiter again in the image. So here's our latest pass, Perjov 16. We're coming in close over the north and um, working our way down uh, towards the south. When we get very close, uh, we're essentially looking in a fog bank. <laughs> uh, uh, and the structure almost disappears. Then it returns, passing the south tropical zone now. Everybody look for the dolphin. See the dolphin? <laughs> and here we are now having our uh, more lengthy uh, view, but also more distant view of the South Pole. And we get to study these uh, southern circumpolar cyclones really quite well. Just in case you missed it, there's the dolphin <laughs> swimming over the waves. And when you put all of the data together, you can see that we, we typically get a good coverage of the polar regions, but just this very narrow swath around Perijov. Now, Juno Cam can only see half of the pole on any given pass. And so um, here's one of those circumpolar cyclones. Uh, and also, the North Pole happens to be in winter night. Jerem, on the other hand, because it's looking at infrared wavelengths, can see everything. And um, I, I'm including this, even though Andy did, because my picture has stars. Therefore, it qualifies as art. But um, here you can see the uh, eight circumpolar cyclones grouped around the North Pole, and there is also a cyclone at the North Pole. Looking at the same data in the Southern Hemisphere, we have the collection of five, and including a sixth one over the pole. Now, it turns out that the one that's over the pole isn't really over the pole. It's about a degree and a half off, and it tends to circle around the pole. And um, in the uh, JunoCam data, uh, we've been tracking it now through all uh, 16 passes, and uh, we can't see the North Pole itself because it's in winter night, but we can by piecing together images from different perijoves, uh, we can see that this structure is incredibly stable. Uh, and in fact, some of the cyclones themselves are even uh, recognizable. So please do go see Fakhredin's uh, talk this afternoon to learn more. Okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually take us from the north to the south and show you all the cool things along the way. So this is an area just off of the polar region. So the pole's right about there. And this is what we call uh, folded filamentary regions. And you can see in our time-lapse sequences, you can see the motion of these little clouds. And so we can actually track how the uh, circulation is going. We were actually surprised that we were able to do that, uh, but Jupiter has cooperated in a big way. Um, we next encounter this incredibly turbulent region, and um, it's really funny because the ground-based astronomers call that the bland zone, and <laughs> I think it's anything but. And then as we move 
s still quite high in, uh, at southern latitudes, um, we start to see what we call these pop-up storms. And they're these little teeny white storms that you can see best down in the lower right corner. Um, they're high. They're actually not that small. They're about 25 to 50 kilometers across. When the lighting's right, you can see them casting little shadows. Um, and we think that they're ammonia ice. Um, but what's driving them is a bit of a, a mystery. And so we're right now we're just working on sort of cataloging where they are, and then we'll try to figure out why they're there. Um, here's another nice storm in the, it, and it really is the north, north, north temperate belt. Uh, I might have called it the wiggly brown belt, but that's just me. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. Oops. And there it is, ready to be hung on your wall. Uh, one thing that we've seen a lot of this year, are the brown barges up close. We've had good coverage for those. That's the North North Temperate Belt brown barge. Uh, and here's what it looks like now as we are approaching Perijove. You can see uh, the um, the detail is getting more and more obscure as you get closer and closer to what looks like a fog bank, although it isn't really. And this is where we see a lot of these Mesa scale waves show up. Uh, one interesting thing was um, on this particular pass, we were interested in seeing the white uh, spot Z. We clipped the end of it, but what we found was this really incredible storm here uh, that is not obvious when you look at, at a ground-based image that it's there. Uh, here is, um, I think this sort of I hope you guys can see the glow. It sort of glows on my screen, this wonderful rendition, uh, which is showing the uh, South Equatorial Belt brown barge. And here's a close-up. Uh, I think that we're, we've gotten such good data on these brown barges, I think that uh, somebody will probably start working on the dynamics. And I should say, JunoCam is outreach not just to the public, it's outreach for scientists. Uh, since we don't have our own science team, all we have is Glenn <laughs> and Fockridden. Um, there's a lot of data going unanalyzed, and uh, so scientists are also welcome to pile on here. Uh, just to point out the, um, can, how can I do this? It's a little hard for me to see. Uh, there's, yeah. So there's that South Equatorial Belt barge that I just showed you. It's this little teeny guy, even though it looked big and wonderful, uh, but compared to the great red spot, it's just, um, it's not. Uh, and, but I want, what I want to point out here is this disturbance. Uh, this is called the South Tropical Disturbance. It, uh, there was a big South Tropical Disturbance from 1900 to 1930, and it lapped the Great Red Spot eight times in those years. Then it kind of went away, and it seems to come back sort of roughly once per decade. Um, the significance for Juno, it, uh, the mission, was that it actually affects the drift rate of the Great Red Spot. And so uh, we found this in um, October of 2017, and then the uh, amateur astronomers started alerting us uh, that um, it was having an effect on the drift rate of the Great Red Spot. Here it is in January, and it's just now in front of the Great Red Spot. And the reason it was significant to the project was because we were at the time debating whether or not to swap Perijove 18 and Perijove 23 so that we would get a Great Red Spot flyover on 18. And so the amateur astronomy community, who are also working quite closely with the project, uh, recommended that we delay our decision as long as we could to make sure that the Great Red Spot would actually be there. And so we did, but um, as it turns out, it's all looking good, and um, we went ahead and made the swap. This is a series of images that we got not in January, but in uh, April. I apologize for the mislabeling on this slide. Uh, this is um, looking at the South Tropical Disturbance 
after it has passed the great red spot. So, but it's just kind of on the tail, literally. So here it is. Um, get the mouse in the right place. Right here. Uh, this area, this whole region that, of the South Tropical Zone that's still disturbed, just past the Great Red Spot. And here's a close-up. And you can see that the turbulence here is actually pulling strands of orange haze off of the Great Red Spot and entraining it in the clouds and you know, kind of disappears as you get further away. Uh, continuing on further south, uh, you can see two of the anticyclonic white ovals in a latitude zone that we call the string of pearls because there tends to be eight or nine of them at any given time. And this was kind of an interesting thing that we were watching in Perjo 15 uh, just a couple months ago. Uh, these two ovals here one is the anticyclonic white oval, the other is the little red spot, uh, were due to converge. The, again, the amateur astronomy community was telling us, keep an eye on these guys. They should be merging just when you fly over. And as it turns out, they did not merge. They repelled and rebounded from each other. And so they're really actually uh, not going to, one is not going to swallow up the other one, at least not right now. And the, uh, the uh, idea is that maybe the turbulence in here, and this is another one of these filamentary folded regions, somehow prevented the two. They also might be at different altitudes because one is bright in methane and the other is dark. So there's a lot going on here, but in any case, there's still two of them. Uh, and that brings me to the uh, South Pole, and we have, um, this is the only talk, or the only picture in my talk that is approximately true color. <laughs> this one was done by Bjorn Johnson, and uh, the image on the left is maybe what you might see with your eyes uh, if you were on this spacecraft. Uh, and so it's got that sort of muted beige, very muted yellow, tone to it. It turns out that the uh, polar regions really do have a sort of a bluish uh, cast, a bluish tint. And um, it's, I'm sure, telling us something about the nature of the aerosols in the polar regions. Uh, and so again, there's you know, some low-hanging fruit for someone who might want to uh, pursue that idea. The image on the right has the phase function removed so that you can see all the way to the terminator and uh, there again we have our uh, our circumpolar cyclones right around the edge there uh, so now a couple of moving away from jupiter and um, looking now at a couple of images from the stellar reference unit the star tracker on the spacecraft this is jupiter's ring it's Jupiter's ring as seen from the inside and looking out towards the sun. And this was, um, this image was acquired in, at Perige of One, you can see the ring halo region and the, the ring itself quite nicely showing up in this image. Here's a very recent uh, image of the ring also from the star tracker, the stellar reference unit. And um, we're coming uh, in from the dark side. We're at 55 degrees north latitude. And it turns out this is a really wonderful place to see the structure again of the ring um, as uh, it's not quite forward scattering, but it's a good geometry for seeing the fine particles in the ring. And uh, it you don't see it up here, even though it extends up here, because that's where Jupiter's shadow is falling on the ring. Okay, Io. I get asked quite frequently, why don't you take pictures of the moons? 
The answer is we're really never very close to them. The closest we really ever get is about 200,000 kilometers, and that's a banner day. Um, this particular set of images was taken from about 350 to about 400,000 uh, kilometers in, in distance. And, um, but we managed to get this really nice series of IO uh, setting behind Jupiter and uh, taking one image out of that series, you can see Io just, oops, oops, um, right on the limb, right there. So we get fun images of Io <laughs> with JunoCam, nothing to make real big discoveries about. Uh, that's actually not the case with Jerem. Jerem has a uh, better telescope, it can get h much higher resolution from much further distances. And so this uh, particular image was acquired, actually it's a set of images, uh, in December of 2017. You can see the distance was 470,000 kilometers, so quite distant really. Uh, and the reason is because we're in this polar orbit. That's why we never get close. Uh, but great data, anyway. The uh, subspacecraft point was 77 south, so we're looking at the south polar region. And Jerem collected 80 images, 80 spectra, and the whole observation lasted about 40 minutes. So drawing your attention to the three spots that have the arrows pointing to them, this one, this one, and this one, those, those particular hot spots, uh, and this is work done by uh, Alessandro Mura on the uh, Jerem team. You can look at a map of Io and try to figure out what those hot, hot spots correspond to. So the first one is right in around here, and that does perhaps uh, coincide with one of the hot spots detected by Voyager. Uh, feature two is over here, and it's not quite so clear, at least not to me, that there was something there to be detected. And then feature three definitely seems like it's a new, uh, new result. So um, this is not really entirely surprising given as how active IO is, but it is pretty cool that uh, with our uh, infrared imager that we can map these hot spots. So I'm just going to what end up here with a couple of what I think are things that I might put on my wall at home. Uh, this really beautiful one uh, from Dominguez. This one from Rickland, I think really actually looks like a painting, an, a beautiful, beautiful oil painting. And here's how an artist would sum up our mission. Those are the, the JunoCam images from each pair of Jove Pass. Thank you. Thank you, Candy. Uh, we have plenty of time. Yeah, so we have uh, time for questions. Uh, if I'll you want to make your way to the mic. Two seconds. Yeah, I'm glad, Norton, again, that there's a closer up, there'll be a closer up version of that IO sequence in the NASA Hyperwall on Thursday at 1230. Go see Io on the Hyperwall? Yeah. Is that what you said, Glenn? Yeah, I'll yes. be there along with Hazes, which I'll talk about then. So I have to comment. The dolphin proves that Sagan and Saltpeter were right about <laughs> the floating life forms. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Although I thought they were going to be jellyfish. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Make a few closing remarks about okay. Yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, well, let's thank, Kenny. thank Kenny once again. Um, before you leave, I would like to remind everybody that there's a, a session P23A, Interiors of Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, Dave Stevenson is chairing that in room 207A, not far from here. Uh, and then following that in the same room, P24B, uh, Jupiter's atmosphere. 
uh, and Juno supporting uh, observations, and that's chaired by Glenn Orton, also in 207A. So you have a very easy afternoon ahead. Uh, and I guess before you leave, I, I would like to uh, mention that uh, Juno is, of course, uh, a new frontier mission. Um, we are approaching the midpoint uh, in the mission with uh, PJ, uh, what is it, uh, 17. 17 coming up on December 21st, uh, which is a week from, from this Friday. Uh, we have a core sampling, uh, a grid about the planet uh, with that uh, perijove. And then, of course, in the second half of the uh, primary mission, we'll be putting a, a, a perijove in between each of the uh, 16 science uh, perijoves that we have uh, at the midpoint in the mission now. And so with that, I guess uh, I thank uh, all of the speakers once again and let you go. Thank you. <laughs>